welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. It's a special edition. I'm Doug Keck, your host, with two special guests. We have here Sister Jane Dominic and Sister John Thomas, both uh, what we would call Nashville Dominicans. Uh, and they are here to talk about a wonderful book, A Short Guide to Praying as a Family, Growing Together in Faith and Love Each Day, which was put together basically by the entire community. Welcome, sisters, to Thank EWTN's you. Bookmark. And you, you are Sister, Sister Jane, Jane Dominic. Dominic. And you are Sister... Sister John, John Thomas. Thomas. Very, very good. So you're here representing, uh, uh, this is a community effort, yes. okay, in a sense your family effort, right? Exactly. With the <laughs> sisters. And many people know you as the Nashville Dominicans because your mother house is in Nashville, right? Mm -hmm. And it was established, what, in the late, what was it? 1860s. 1860s, right after the Civil War, right around the time of the right Civil War, right? Right before the outbreak of the Civil War. It was War. right before. Okay, very good. Okay, so praying as a family. Now, Dominicans are known as being teachers, okay? Do you see prayer, Sister Jane, as as a teaching method? Or what do you see prayer, what place does it hold in the education or support of a Catholic family? Well, you know, it's interesting because in the Dominican order, we make a distinction actually between what it means to teach and what it means to preach. When Jesus came, he came to preach. So to preach is to teach and to heal together. Mm -hmm. So it's to bring a truth that heals. And this is precisely what prayer does. When we preach about prayer, what happens? People begin to realize that prayer is something that opens you to God, mm -hmm. opens you to the other members of your family in a way you weren't open before. And because of that openness, a real healing can take place. Mm -hmm. You can have those important conversations about, I need to ask your forgiveness, or do you know how important you are in my mm -hmm. life? So to preach about prayer is to bring that very thing, mm -hmm. God, <laughs> into the life of the family so that there can be healing within the mm -hmm. family. I think even the church's recognition of the pastoral care that the family needs, especially today, is reflected in things like the two synods of the family mm -hmm. and the world meeting of families that will be, that coming has happened a, in September. Yeah, it's coming in September. Okay, great. Okay, very good. Uh, yeah, in fact, I was thinking when I first saw this book that this would be a great uh, thing for families to pick up, possibly, hopefully through our EWTN religious catalog or whatever, but to be able to pick up a book like this as preparation really for the combination of the uh, World Media Families happening in September as well as the papal visit as well that people can look forward to all, of course, covered wall to wall here on EWTN, our pleasure. Now, Sister John Thomas, uh, do you know why the your order decided to do this. What was the genesis? Was this something that uh, one sister came forward with? Uh, did St. Benedict Press say, hey, we need a book on prayer. Uh, let's ask the sisters. How did this come about? Well, I think it, in our role as educators within the classroom, um, we see that what our role is as teachers is supportive of the parents' primary role as educators of their children, first and foremost in the faith. And so what we do in the school is really meant to support and serve their role as parents. And so we see that there, is, um, there are many parents who want to pass on the faith to their children, who want their family to be a school of prayer but might not have the resources or the formation themselves as parents to be able to create that environment of prayer within their family. And so we wanted to provide something that would meet the needs mm -hmm. of the family where they are in their beautiful task mm -hmm. of forming that um, environment within their home that can raise children in, in their relationship with mm -hmm. the Lord and help them on their journey to heaven. Mm -hmm. And uh, our community has um, sought m many ways to try to uh, support that role of the families as the primary educators of their children through multiple different mm -hmm. initiatives, uh, one being a retreat house that we have um, in, uh, in Tennessee mm -hmm. that can help uh, offer retreats for moms and dads and help them develop their own personal spiritual life um, to grow as spouses together. And then from that So it would be like life, a couples kind of thing? Because I know you have couple prayer as one of the things in here, or could it be either? Could it be how it was actually, work? we did moms only, and then we did dads only, because okay. we thought that there would be... There's a different spirituality there, you Well, think? because of masculine spirituality, right? right? The, the leadership, his priestly, prophetic, and kingly mm -hmm. role within mm -hmm. the home is different from the mother who nurtures. It was so beautiful. One of the mothers this was saying... This is very countercultural. It is. Sister, it I, is. You know, I hope but you know. You know uh, it actually also, <laughs> in a sense, reflects the reality of the human person. Mm -hmm. One mother was saying, this is the way I see it. I'm the heart, and he's the head. Mm -hmm. So she was saying, you know, so 
I thought we should start praying as a family. And I found this book, so I brought it to my husband and I asked him. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful because that's, in a sense, the way prayer works. Mm -hmm. God puts something on our hearts and then it consults the head. <laughs> right. So there was this, so what basically moms were able to do was speak to each other about the many challenges, mm -hmm. the difficulties, struggling with technology, right? Mm -hmm. Kids will say, but mom, I'm the only one that doesn't. Right, right, sure. So, and then they realize, wait a minute, I'm not the only one because I know these other moms and they're right, doing the right. same thing. So we did it actually according to school at the very beginning. So all the moms from one school were invited to come to this retreat. And then they could talk about the difficulties, the challenges, the joys. Mm -hmm. And then same thing, the dads would have that. And it was so funny, like even the differences between the retreats, like dads mm -hmm. were much less, mm -hmm. We had silence, which is a new thing for most people to experience silence. These days especially, right? The dads were great at it, but the moms, it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was a real challenge. But it became an opportunity for them to speak to each other and the Lord mm -hmm. about what does it mean? What's the vocation of Catholic motherhood? What's the right. vocation of Catholic fatherhood? And it was in that context, in addition to the classroom, that we recognized right. parents could really use a resource that would strengthen them and help them to have that secure feeling because what we were encountering was this sense of inadequacy that parents right. had. Well, why is that? Is it because we they weren't catechized? Is it because we live in the era of the expert and so parents are made to feel like they're not up to the task? You know, it's I think what qualifies parents is that wedding ring. <laughs> when you receive the sacrament of matrimony, you have the gift to be able to pray with your children. So some parents didn't grow up praying in their own families, and they might be hesitant to initiate family mm -hmm. prayer because of that. So what this book does is it gives them a concrete tool with concrete suggestions mm -hmm. about how to pray together. And even, I think one of the beautiful things that has come up in some of these discussions is parents realizing, you know, there's simple ways that I can be present to my child. So for instance, how many moms were talking about, you know, I'm on the phone when I come to pick my child up. You know, you haven't seen your child since breakfast, mm -hmm. or you come to pick your children up, and then, you know, you, you click open the van door, and, you're, and you say, oh, hi, sweetheart, and then you, you know, get back on the phone. Mm -hmm. How does that make the child feel? Right. So some of the moms decided, you know what, from now on, what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn off our cell phones as soon as, you know, we open that car door so that they can be completely present to their children. Because in a sense, car time is prime time mm -hmm. when you can catch up. Everything's fresh in your child's mind. And think how that- They can't run away. Exactly, they're, they're, they're there. They're captive <laughs> audience. So, but think about how that changes the child's mm -hmm. day. When mom sees you again for the first time, all her attention is on you, or is on the two of you, or mm -hmm. the three of you, or how many ever just got into the van. And, I think they'll look forward more and more to that time, both mom and the children, if you don't have something like technology involved, mm -hmm. disrupting, in a sense, what's the natural flow of the love between a mom and her children, or in, you know, even a dad and the children. So. Now, Sister, uh, Sister John, uh, let me ask you, because we're talking here about education and we're talking about the primacy of the parents. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason today that, that we need to stress that so much? Has that been lost in your mind? The in a primacy. sense of education of the children, especially in the faith. Uh, yes, I think, again, what Sister said about the parents' feeling of inadequacy, mm -hmm. and um, they may ha themselves have um, not experienced um, that love in their, in their own lives mm -hmm. or understand their role as children of the Heavenly Father. And I think um, the more they can reconnect through their, their personal prayer life with their understanding of um, I am loved by the Father, it is good that I exist, and my very personhood is a gift, um, then, then they are able to, mm -hmm. in turn, um, participate in God's way of loving their children, of, of being a parent, and um, able to um, share that delight. He's the God mm -hmm. the Father said, I you know, delight in you. And when they know themselves to be a delight of the Heavenly Father, then mm -hmm. they can, um, with their children, share that um, delight of the Heavenly Father um, in them. Okay. Let me ask you, uh, Sister Jane, in, in the sense of the way it's laid out, is that why, in a sense, you've got like multiple phases, the way yes, it's laid out, in a exactly. sense, like basic vocal prayers, making your home a sacred place, and then advancing in the prayer life. And, and, and then, uh, you know, preparing for the sacraments, phase four, phase five, you've got exactly. that way so a family can kind of jump in and start slowly, exactly. right? Exactly. So in our discussions, we had to decide how we wanted to lay the book out. 
And what we decided was that what would be best is if we made a book that was for beginners, but also for those who already pray, mm -hmm. and even for the advanced to challenge them even more. Mm -hmm. So that's why we started with just the simple basic vocal prayers because, for instance, there's such a richness in the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. For instance, making the sign of the cross. Right. It contains the two greatest mysteries of our faith, the Trinity and the Paschal mystery, right? The cross where Jesus died for us and from whence he rose. So when we teach parents about it through this book, what they can do mm -hmm. is they can teach their children about it. But then we also add practical things like it really is worth the time mm -hmm. to stop and show your little one how to make the sign of the cross. Why? Because then the child feels included. Mm -hmm. Or what's really beautiful is when you see older brothers or sisters, you know, helping the two or three year old right. to make the sign of the cross. So simple things like that. But so we go through, in a sense, mm -hmm. the, the theology or the meaning of each of the prayers. Like right. we don't worship the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is the distinction. Right, but rather because she's the mother of Jesus. And why do we call God Father? Mm -hmm. Because that's what Christ taught us. And it's right. such a precious word, Father, that God doesn't reveal himself as master or teacher, as Lord primarily, but right. as Father. Right. So what does it mean to address him that way? One of the things that struck me too, uh, making the sign of the cross, and I, I was just thinking what you just said, in the, in the sense that just in doing it, it's like kind of, kind of sometimes we do it going in and out of mass, you know, do the whole right. We kind of do a thing, you know, it's like uh, people are talking and doing, but it is like you said, in a sense, uh, and I see grace before meals you have here, which I think is a great thing for a family to do, and even grace after meals, which I can't say that I haven't done since grammar school. I read that prayer, I'm like I was flashing back to St. Pius X. But, you know, you say a value practice in making the sign of the cross right after you wake up in the morning too. I had never heard that. Why, yes. why, why, do you, why, would, why did you Actually, particularly point that out? We got that from one of the moms who's okay. participated in, in consulting in a sense in this book. Because we had the moms on the retreats, we've also had moms who are connected to our community through our various apostolic activities. And she actually said that that's something that her son decided to do on his own because he saw it as a kind of armor for the day. Mm -hmm. Because you do. It was so funny, I was teaching kindergarten and we were talking about the sign of the cross and this kindergartner came up to me and he said, sister, it's like this. God, I give you my mind, I give you my heart, and I give you my whole self. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And right. I thought, this kindergartner. <laughs> That's right, see, uh, out of the mouth of babes, right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, sister John, uh, what is the relationship between prayer and a fulcrum as laid out by Archbishop Chaput in the forward of this book? I think that is a beautiful forward because right. Deep family prayer has the power to radically transform culture. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways it does that is within the family, it makes a space for God. Mm -hmm. And we, the, the children come to um, encounter God in whose image they were made. So they come to know who they are. And then they come to meet him and encounter mm -hmm. him. Um, in each other um, as well, this, this beautiful dynamic that opens up through all these different ways of prayer that are laid out in the book that um, create this communion of persons that mm -hmm. is reflective of God himself, the Trinity, the family being the icon of the Trinity, and in something such as the family meeting, mm -hmm. um, they, they learn to yeah, honor. Yeah, you have a family meeting once a month yes, kind of a thing. Yes, I love mm -hmm. that. It's one of my favorite prayers in there. And mm -hmm. in fact, my family grew up doing this. Okay. So the family meeting, you come together once a month and either mom or dad starts with a prayer. And then you go in age order. See, because this way there's a predictability, right? Mm -hmm. Just like getting in line for confession, you know you're next. Or you know you have five more people <laughs> before it's your turn. So <laughs> right, okay. you go in age order. So dad, mom, then oldest, next, next, next. Okay. And the first round, there's three basic rounds in the family meeting. So the first round is what's called honoring one another. So they go down in age order and each one takes a turn honoring someone else in the room. Okay. So for instance, dad might say, you know, I wanna honor mom because so-and-so has been sick and a lot has been going on and mm -hmm. she has been not a single word of complaint, mm -hmm. etc." And then, you know, you get to the little brother and the little brother honors his older brother. I wanna thank Tom because he could have gone to the baseball game, but he stayed to help me with my math homework and right. he was so patient. He's right. an awesome brother. Right. And what happens in that honoring one another right is each individual family member sees, this is the gift I have to give. Right. Because we do have so much to give to each other. And how important their actions are to exactly. the others in the family, even if they don't see it. Exactly. Because I think all of us would say that, and we find, I know my own children, the things you thought they would remember or they care about, yeah, 
It's, but they come up with other situations, these little asides or little situations that were the ones that they really remember and really impacted them. Exactly. So you never know. And that's why I think in the beginning he talks about how important it is as Archbishop Hugh to be as a couple and as a family, how much a personal example is the most powerful teacher in the world. Yes. It says how they learn, meaning the children, fidelity instead of broken promises, patience instead of restlessness, simplicity in place of confusion, humility instead of pride, courage in place of cowardice, honesty instead of excuse, forgiveness in place of revenge, a hunger for justice in place of apathy. And those are all the virtues that in many cases are missing in our society. Exactly, today, and that's right? what happens in that family meeting when they honor one another, those virtues are, are drawn out. So that's the first round, honoring one another. The second round is asking forgiveness of each other. Mm -hmm. And here, in a sense, that resentment can start to melt away because family members start to recognize how they're perhaps hurting each other. Mm -hmm. So when dad goes first, he might apologize. Susie, I'm so sorry I was late in picking you up. I got too caught up in what I was doing, and I know you had to wait. And so he asks forgiveness of Susie. And what? a beautiful gesture and what a beautiful witness to the rest of the family. Because right. in a sense, it gives everyone permission to make mistakes, right. to once in a while fall back into selfishness, but then I know I can come right back out of it. So that's the second round, and that it beautifully opens up each of the family members again. Mm -hmm. Because remember, I think the temptations that are in the family are to take each other for granted. And honoring one another stops that from happening. Right. And then resentment and unforgiveness, so asking forgiveness also stops that. The third and final round is basically telling your status. <laughs> so dad will tell what's going on with him, maybe at work. Mom talks about what's going on with her, maybe at work, at home. And then older brother, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down. And you hear things you never heard before. So I still remember when I was growing up, we had these family meetings. And I'm one of six, and I'm in the middle, happy middle child. And my oldest sister was always like Miss Perfect. And she's an internal medicine doctor now, and she's married to a cardiologist. So mm -hmm. always over the overachiever, and she was always the unattainable ideal. And I remember at one of these family meetings, she broke down crying because she was having a hard time because we had moved so many times, like within a short period of time. And she just said, you know, it's really stressful. <laughs> and I always feel like I have to be a good example. Mm -hmm. And just for me to see that, in a sense, I received the gift of my sister right. in a completely new way. I realized she's human, she's like me. Right. And I also understood that I can express the things I'm having a hard time with and that's okay. Mm -hmm. So there are beautiful, simple things like that that come out in the family meeting. And then at the very end, to close the meeting, the father will give a blessing, mm -hmm. first to the mother and then to each of the children. And he'll make the blessing, if he can, if mm -hmm. he wants, based on what each of the persons said during the meeting. Right, okay. And it's a beautiful thing. The presence of the Father is, is mm -hmm. the symbol of God the Father blessing. Right. And the Father's blessing, if you look at the Old Testament, right. carries exceptional power. Mm -hmm. and, so, you can, and you can see how a model like this mm -hmm. type of prayer in the family, if this were to overflow into society, right. the resentment and the individualism that permeate our right. society will gradually melt away as right. uh, each, each person within the family and each family becomes radically transformed by these experiences of prayer right. within the context of the family, then it will be that fulcrum that changes society. Right, and talk, by praying we learn how to listen to him, how to be docile to his promptings and attentive, his way of seeing reality. Now, because again, I think what happens is we live in a society of fear. People are afraid to show who they are because they're afraid they'll be laughed at, they'll be embarrassed, or someone will take advantage of their weakness and exploit that. Right. One of the things I thought was, too, was good too when you were talking about doing this kind of three-step program and stuff is that you make the point also in the book, listen, this is a guide. Exactly. It means <laughs> you, you fit it to your own situation. No one's saying that if you don't do this exactly this way, it won't work. This is the five-step plan you have to it follow. It was funny, Doug. This right? came up in, in some of our sister meetings. Mm -hmm. One of the sisters said, wait a minute. We don't want to micromanage people. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but then right. some, you know, other people mm -hmm. would say, but they need, some of them, they yes. like having concrete stuff. Right. So we'd ask the moms and dads, yeah, steps, we like steps. <laughs> <Right>. So <laughs> Yeah, no, it's good to have the outline, mm -hmm. but realize exactly. that it's, there's, there's a not a rigidity there. That, and this was also, because I could see myself, to, please remember that merely saying the prayers is not <laughs> the goal. The goal is praying personally, encountering the Lord, listening to Him and giving Him your heart. So I guess it's, uh, you know, cause sometimes when we, we, we race through the rosary or something mm -hmm. like that, like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you know <laughs> I mean, that kind of thing, you, you, it's kind of like I'm checking my boxes. Mm -hmm. We take the way we live our lives and put that onto our prayer life. Mm -hmm. 
where, mm -hmm. well, I'm supposed to do this, and I'm supposed to do that. Oh, I got that, exactly. got that, that. But did I get anything out of it? Mm -hmm. And did I listen to anything? And right. did I take anything away? So. And we bring that up in the book, too. So, for instance, when we talk about family bedtime prayers, sometimes if you're on a family trip and you're on the way home, right. maybe the best time to do the family bedtime prayers exactly. is in the car. A great idea. You know, right. and just shorten them a little bit because everybody's exhausted. And the point is, let's give God our hearts mm -hmm. and thank Him for this wonderful trip we just had. Well, I have to confess that uh, years ago, uh, we adapted sometimes the Fatima shortcut rosary <laughs> that Jacinta had decided to do the, you that. know, just once in a while. But uh, Our Father, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. Yeah, Hail Mary, Hail Mary right, exactly. And I think, <laughs> I think the book gives families a lot of freedom right. and to, to be creative within the context of their own family dynamic and their own family needs. But it kind of um, shows two different areas in which families can develop these different fam uh, prayer practices. And one is the, the ones that grow naturally out of the pre-existing family routines, like mm. bedtime prayer, mm -hmm. right. or s there's a section for prayer before sports games. Yeah, I saw that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or That's in the actually car. become a, a, a bit of a problem in some places if you're right. not in, you know, I mean, we're not supposed to pray. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things the Holy Father's really drawing our attention to is this notion of rest. You know, because you can go from checking Facebook to calling this person and then looking at something on the internet or, or whatever, and we just go from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing and we never pause. And then we say, wait a minute, I didn't have time to pray. Mm -hmm. And that, that causes a frenziedness and we're not present to each other. So rest, it encourages us to, in a sense, reassess our priorities. And by the way this book is organized and how, like Sister just said, you integrate prayer into things you already do, mm -hmm. it in a sense helps prayer to naturally enter each part of your day. Right, exactly. And I think one of the most important prayers in that book, and also emphasized by Pope Francis, is spousal prayer, right. or praying with your spouse. spouse right. And in fact, it follows that same order, basically, that the family meeting follows. Mm -hmm. So you honor one another, you ask forgiveness for one another, and then you can, instead of speaking about each other's status, which you could do, you can right. also pray for each one of your children. You know, right. I'm worried about so-and-so because I'm noticing she's starting to get interested in boys and I don't know if this is healthy at her age, right. et cetera. Right. So right. you can pray together for your children and imagine how powerful that is for the children, right. but also for building your family relationship. And in doing that, I know coming out of marriage encounter, that was one of the things, praying with yes. spouse, et cetera, that kind of, and communication. And again, if you start with prayer and you open that up, it allows you to open up each other in a, in, in a safer place, like mm -hmm. the family, to have that conversation without feeling like, well, if I'm going to say this, you're going to take it the wrong way, right. etc. I also thought it was interesting because you were talking about being tired, and I always think of the old line, fatigue makes cowards of us all, that, you know, <laughs> when that happens. But sleepless nights, quiet times, and examines. Sleepless yes. nights or other quiet times are perfect for helping to form your children's hearts and minds. So say you. That's right. Okay. So, you know, a child, something is on, you can't go to sleep, can't go to sleep, because they're thinking about, you know, I got in a fight with so-and-so today, and uh, I didn't handle, I mean, I didn't, I just feel bad about it, and I, so what can you do? You sit there with your child, and you talk them through, okay, so what happened? Well, what can you do? And then because they think at the family meeting, Guess mm -hmm. I could ask forgiveness, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you give you help. In a sense, it's it's the perfect time, in mm -hmm. a sense, to show the child concretely how the faith enters into their ordinary life. So it gives parents the opportunity to really form their children mm -hmm. in what it means to think like a person of faith, to think with Christ, to speak to Christ, to speak to their guardian mm -hmm. angels, to talk to Mary about what can I do, what can I do to resolve this? Or even things like what can I be grateful for? Right. So, or if something great happened to that child and so the child is so excited, right. to draw them to, you know, why do you think so and so gave you her only whatever? Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and I guess because she loves me and right. she's generous. Right. So it, you can bring them to focus, to think about the virtues, right. to think about the goodness of others, right. to desire that goodness for themselves. Right. Or maybe they can talk about technology. Maybe there was something that they were exposed to somehow accidentally that mm. was disturbing to them. Right. And that bedtime opens up 
right. this time for discussion. And then the mom finds out. It's almost like a parental confessional. Period exactly. There in that There's a beautiful interplay between right. the conversations that happen, like maybe in the car, how that could lead to prayer. Mm -hmm. We could bring all these things to prayer. Right. And the things that they express in prayer, whether they're seeking forgiveness right. or asking for help or expressing gratitude, right. um, those also open up a doorway for parents to enter into their children's lives and their hearts in a right. deeper way that they might not have been able to outside of discovering those things right. through prayer. Right. And so many parents talk about how adolescence is such a difficult period of time in a child's mm -hmm. life. But if you start praying with them when they're little, what happens? There's a natural flow into their adolescence mm -hmm. and you are still very much a part of their lives. Right, and sometimes you don't see it on the surface because of the nature of teenage life and things, how those happen. Right. But there's an undercurrent there and that's what you gotta hope right. is there as well. Mm -hmm. Just before we go, because we're out of time, you talk about beauty in the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. Beauty is called the attractive prayer of the truth, that something extra which makes truth not right. only noble but delightful. Well, that's Dennis beautiful, McNamara's there's beautiful appendix, yes. There's beautiful stained uh, glass. And there was also, who was it? Father was it Lawrence Father Lou. Lou. Father yes. Lou was a picture in the back. So he was the one who actually took the pictures of these? Yes, things? and he was so gracious in allowing us to use his beautiful images. So he's a Dominican of mm -hmm. the English province, and he is stationed in Edinburgh. So okay. he's been able to take these beautiful stained glass windows and share them with families. So this is truly universal. It is. And it international is. there. Yeah. Well, we're just out of time here speaking with Sister Jane Dominic, thank you so much, and Sister John Thomas about a wonderful new book, A Short Guide to Praying as a Family. Short, so you can take it as you leave it. <laughs> you know, Growing Together in Faith and Love Each Day, Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia Congregation, better known by all of us as the Nashville Dominicans, a wonderful book, a great book for your family uh, to work on its prayer life, especially with the World Meeting of Families coming up. We highly endorse it here at EWTN, get it through our EWTN Religious Catalog, St. Benedict Press, I'm Doug Keck. Join us next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark.